discussion and then afterwards we'll have it available just on our YouTube page if you want to refer back to it as well as write up a little blog on it. But um, look, we may as well get started. Thank you all for jumping on so promptly. Um, today we've got a really exciting session. Should we click on the next one? Yeah. All focused around custom visuals, as Alice said. So you can see we've got our three presenters here with their Christmas hats on. So we'll the order is actually a bit different to what you see on the screen. We've got Daniel Marsh Patrick calling in from New Zealand, who is a bit of a custom uh, visual developer guru um, with such visuals as the violin plot, small multiples line chart and HTML content, just to name a few. Um, so Daniel will give us a bit of an intro into the world of custom visuals, what goes on in sort of developing them and different things you have to consider. Then we'll actually jump to Alice um, and she'll share some of the five uh, favorite custom visuals that we use here at Discovery Eye and the uh, working in developing environmental and water power BI reports. And then we'll go to Kerry, who will focus on a bit more of the design elements um, with the title of the session Beyond Click and Viz. And just a bit of housekeeping uh, for everyone. So um, ideally, if you're on the app, that's good. Once the um, presenters begin, if you want to mute yourself, especially when you're not speaking, and also just turn your video off as a bit of a courtesy. Uh, feel free to type any questions in or any comments. Hello, Fernando as well, one of our regulars. Good to see you again, mate. Um, and if you do have any questions, there'll be an opportunity at the end of each of the presenters' um, sessions uh, for about five minutes Q&A. So if you want to ask a question, feel free to put your video on and come off mute and ask directly. As I mentioned, oh, we'll go back. The session's being recorded, uh, just so everyone knows. And a Teams tip, if you want to zoom in to some of the shared content, just hold control and use the scroll in your mouse and then you can actually get in there as well. That's a Matt Burr tip. <laughs> okay, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we are presenting today here in South Melbourne um, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging and also um, pay uh, acknowledgement to the Aboriginal elders of those communities that you're all dialing in from wherever you are in the world. So um, at Discovery Eye, our sponsor, um, <laughs> sort of stuff that we do is Power BI training, report mm -hmm. development, custom visual development, working with Daniel as part of our team. Also more of the design space, so infographic and animations, as well as custom web apps and tools using JavaScript and such coding platforms. And excitingly, um, moving into 2021, we're actually looking at growing our team. So for anyone that's interested out there, um, if you consider yourself a bit of an intermediate data analyst and have a specific passion about the environment and the water industry, um, we'd love to hear from you. So we're looking for people that are enthusiastic about Power BI, have a bit of domain knowledge about the environmental and the water industry, which is largely where we work, a um, bit of a problem solver, outside of the box thinker, and also someone um, you know, that's quite personable and also keen to sort of explore extracurricular related activities such as writing blogs, conferences, and really just getting involved in this fantastic community that we have um, globally, as well as here in Melbourne and just across Australia and New Zealand. So yeah, if you're interested, feel free to send through some information or um, ask more questions, just set the email address below. Cool, so I've kind of run through this. Today's agenda, we'll go with Daniel first. Then we'll move on to Alice and then Kerry will bring us home. So thank you all to our presenters. And without further ado, Daniel, I'll hand it over to you, mate, if you want to share your screen. Yeah, we'll do. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. okay. How are we doing? Screens up? Yeah, perfect. <clears throat> awesome. I've got to apologize because for some reason, Zoom, it's not working on my machine. Um, so you may have to use the team zoom if you want to look at anything in specific detail but if there's any particular questions you want to ask just queue them up in the window and we'll deal with them at the end i gotta be brief <laughs> so yeah um hi everyone thanks for having me i'm daniel i am an mvp based out in new zealand down in canterbury um i work for well myself as a consultant for a company called kochubo uh, mostly specializing in developing power bi solutions and custom visuals um, I also help the Discovery AI folks out and work with them on a lot of what they do, which is really awesome. And I'm also a coach with Radicat, if you're familiar with those folks too. Um, my goal today is to try and encompass custom visuals in a very short space of time. Uh, I'm usually used to talking about these within about an hour or so, but we'll try and do a very quick whistle stop tour of some of the options. I'm bound to miss stuff. I'm bound to breeze other stuff. But again, ask away. I'm very happy to answer questions. 
So in terms of visuals, Power BI has your standard visuals available in the palette here. And we're here today to talk about custom visuals. But let's walk through a little scenario because I've got probably a few days until this is a valid scenario. Microsoft actually put some features in that change it. So I have a workbook here with, I'm pretty sure, yep, yeah, Zoomit just really doesn't want to work. Um, some simple environmental data. So I actually have some temperature readings across major cities in New Zealand for the last couple of hundred years. And what I'm going to do is, you know, if I use a core line chart in Power BI, it's pretty easy just to drag my, I have a 10 year average uh, measure, uh, like an average temperature by month over 10 years, um, and a line chart. So I can put my year on the axis and I've got a very simple line chart. This is a smoother line um, because the discrete measurements are quite, you know, minute. Uh, very high grain. So this helps to smooth things out for the reader a little bit. So that's great. And this is the whole of New Zealand. So if I want to start breaking this down a little bit using the core visuals, um, currently this is a bit tricky. So one of the obvious things I might do is I might whack a field into the legend. So and for brevity and time, I'm, I'm using some pre can slides. But I can use a line chart. I can put the city field, and this shows us the cities in New Zealand. Uh, we now get, you know, lots of pretty little colors um, we get an alphabetic legend and we get some lines but what's really tricky about this is it's quite hard to resolve it creates some cognitive load because it's really hard to say well which city has the highest temperature you've got to kind of look at that line and then you've got to go up to the legend and figure it out and also if i were to tell you where's auckland it's not very easy to see it's actually kind of buried behind waitakere now for those of you that know auckland technically waitakere North Shore and all of Auckland are technically more or less the same geography. Um, so that doesn't really give us any insight. So this is kind of the limits we have with the core visuals in Power BI at the moment, at least I'm told until the next release comes out. So what we could do with this is we could think about intro introducing a technique known as multivariate analysis, trellising or small multiples. So what I could do is I could take these charts and break them down individually. And we can see that I've now got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, nine charts on the screen, one for each city. They've all got the same y-axis. They're in alphabetical order. And we can now see comparatively how Auckland compares with, say, Christchurch. And we can we can see that Auckland, North Shore, and Waitakere are all fairly similar. Now, these require nine individual charts. And of course, the last who select only grabs a few, but you can see where I'm getting at. It's probably easier if I just click down here. So I've got all of these little charts set up. Now, if I want to change something, I've got to select all these charts and I've got to change one thing if it lets me do it. Also, if I want to have a slicer, <clears throat> I can slice to Auckland, but then I get these artifacts left behind. So it's quite hard to work around it. And then if a new city arrives, I've then got to add another chart. So it gets kind of tricky. So, <clears throat> What's nice about custom visuals is they're an option that we can use to extend the core visuals from Power BI. And it's one of the cool things that, you know, Microsoft uh, has quite a bit different to some other providers is that they extend their framework open to visuals developers like myself. Um, so we have a number of visuals that we can choose from and they're developed by both Microsoft and people out in the community like myself. So Microsoft release some others that are not core visuals and they put them in the marketplace. Uh, they can be free or open source, released for no charge, or they could be commercial ones. And there's some incredibly good ones that um, cost almost as much as Power BI, but provide an, a huge amount of value. And visuals are published to a location called AppSource, which you might know as the marketplace. And if I just do a quick breakout here, and my windows are, oh, I don't have long at all. AppSource is a place where people host visuals. So we actually have 306 visuals today in the marketplace and if we want to get access to these in power bi we can either click on the ellipsis here and get more visuals or we can click more visuals in the ribbon and teams oh teams has been good to me today usually this freezes up for about two minutes and we have a marketplace of visuals now in here we've got visuals that are known as certified they have these little blue stars next to them and certified visuals have been fully reviewed by microsoft and have um an extra little bit of permissions around them. So if you export to PDF, if you send um, reports as emails, those visuals are allowed to turn up. We have some that aren't forecasted. They're known as, well, we just call them standard visuals. They're in the marketplace, but they haven't been fully reviewed. They're not necessarily any less safe. And I have a very long presentation about the subjective 
how you can find that stuff out and learn more about that, but that's a really not a today thing. But if I were to look for something that were to do what we wanted, I can search for small and I can find my small multiple line chart. So if I want to click on that, click add. I already have it in the report because I'm Batman level prepared for today. But that's basically how it's there. And then we get a little visual over here on the on the visuals pane. So if I were to repeat the previous exercise, I can put this visual on the canvas. And I've got some extra data roles here. So I can pop city in the small multiple. That's how I want my chart to be extrapolated out. I want to put my 10 year average and I want to put my calendar year. And all of a sudden this visual is a single box, but it's produced one chart for each city and they've all got the same scale and axes. And if I start to resize, then it moves them around and gives us a bit of responsiveness and I can put some properties in here. You know, I can put borders around a small multiples and make them stand out a little bit more. And with a bit of effort, because I'm having to do here's one I prepared earlier, um, we can make designs that look, say, like this. Um, and this is a seasonality chart that um, Alberto Cairo has, uh, has done and I've plagiarized. Uh, but we've been able to line the charts up in the same visual by month, and we we're able to see the yearly trends in an individual chart. And what we can do with these visuals, if we put the time in, we can wire them up to tooltips so I can have a report page tooltip of more small multiples. So if each month I can look at the city breakdown, these visuals filter nicely. So if I filter it down to Auckland, the results will update to match and I can add more or not. So another thing that Power BI doesn't have are statistical type visuals uh, in the core set. So one of the visuals that I developed is uh, a violin plot, which if you're familiar with a box plot, what this allows us to do is sample our data within the visual. So this has some logic to do a lot of the aggregations and analysis. So I can drag a field in here that makes it unique. I can add my mean temperature in and I get a very lovely visual, but let's just do something a little bit better. So we'll put our cities in here. Now what we have is if you're familiar with the box plot, we've got the standard median, mean, quartiles and confidence intervals. But we also have a separate plot against the visual that shows the distribution. So it's not box plots are great, but they don't always tell you enough about the modality of the data. We can see here that there's a couple of bumps. And these are really varied depending on where you go. So for instance, Dunedin has a really long range, whereas Auckland's a bit less, you know, a bit within a tighter band. But this is quite a good way of being able to get those statistics, but also see those multimodalities, which is probably seasonality in this case. And again, I did prepare one, but that's pretty much the gist of it. And I got to move on because there's plenty of other stuff to get onto today. You also have the option of using the native R and Python visuals. Uh, so these are exposed in Power BI and developed by Microsoft. And these add a visual to the canvas. And if you have R and or Python running locally, you can drag your fields in and you can write some code. And I just did a couple earlier. And what's nice about these ones is you can leverage existing libraries. So here with R script, I'm using ggplot. And I've just wrote a little bit of code to use the fields in my data set to produce a similar chart. So I can do a small multiple chart using R. And the Python one uses Seaborn. And it's a little bit more code, but it's fairly straightforward. What's nice about these is uh, if you're familiar with these languages, you have the ability to have a bit more control. These visuals render as images. They're not interactive, but you can filter data going into them. So I could click Lower Hut. Um, and eventually there's a little bit of a, a cold start with these visuals. So they take a little bit of time to get started, but they're great if you're doing data science or analysis tasks that are probably localized to your machine. You do need the R dependencies on your machine and any users also need them. And if you put it up into the Power BI service, then Microsoft do host some libraries and you do get a little bit of uh, compatibility, but you also have to be careful about things like emails and the like, because they're treated essentially the same as uh, standard visuals. I am pretty short on time, so I'm just going to very quickly introduce you to the concept of Charticulator. Charticulator is a tool that Microsoft Research have produced, and it is a no-code platform that you can use to design visuals. I was going to hopefully run through this, but I've got, again, here's one I prepared earlier. So I have a data set, which looks like this, my uh, month and a temperature anomaly, and I'm, I'm able to design visuals using drag and drop. 
And what I'm able to do is export this to a custom visual and import these into Power BI. So here's an example of that custom visual. And these visuals are quite nice. We get, you know, here's one uh, that's a scatter plot with two linear series and the radial version of that showing months and temperature variation from a 1950s average. So it's getting pretty hot pretty quickly. But these are responsive too. So I can drag my slices and I get different filter, you know, the filter contexts accordingly. So it's quite a nice option. And and Charticulator is is one that we could spend a lot of time on, and I've presented on it a few times. So I'm keen if Alice and Christian are keen to cover this, I'm quite happy to come back and do it. And the last one I want to introduce, if I've got time. How am I doing for time, folks? Um, yeah, you're going really well, Daniel. Lovely. Okay. Please yell when it's time for me to stop. My time has gone off, so I'll just keep going until you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just keep going. Uh, we've got a question in the um, chat, and uh, it might be good to save a little bit of time if there's any yep, others. No but, worries. Uh, yeah, don't I'll rush. Very, very quick. <clears throat> so the R and Python visuals give people that want to do a little bit more than clicky, clicky, draggy, droppy with their visuals, and Charticulator gives us a bit more of a visual interface to, to design things. Um, I've been very interested in helping people that want to do a little more with visuals in Power BI have a bit more power at, at the cost of a little less you know, user friendliness. So I have a visual called HTML content, which allows you to uh, create measures and render HTML within Power BI within reason. One thing I've been working on the last week or so and on and off over the last couple of years is the concept of introducing what's called visualization grammar to Power BI. So I have this little visual here that I am christening Deneb. And what we can do with this is we can pretty much add fields to our visual. Let's grab that one. So this is not particularly exciting right now. What Deneb intends to do is to bring a language called Vega into Power BI. So Vega is a language where you can write chart definitions in JSON. So we can expand the visual out. And I put in a little template spec here just to save me some time, but we can write a chart definition in JSON. I can, I'll just copy that because that's got a degree symbol in because I'm a silly boy. Let's paste that in. And I'll just grab city as well. I'll eventually have auto complete in here. And when I've got this typed out, I can click apply and I get a simple bar chart. So this is probably the simplest chart you can do, but I've got my cities on the on the left and my temperature on the right on the bottom. I can collapse the pane to have a little look at it in bigger detail. If I need more room to edit my code, I can drag my drag my pane in and out, my chart resizes dynamically. But more importantly, when I go back to the report, I've got a chart that I can resize and move around and I can just bit that out and tweak it if I want to do that. So it, here's one I prepared earlier. Here's a little dashboard I prepared with all the visuals except for the slices at the top using this, this visual. So we have a heat map by month, by year of the average temperatures in New Zealand. And if we open that up, we can see that we have a little more of a detailed definition, but I could say, you know, if I want to change the, the label of that axis there, I could just, uh, you know, change that and click apply. And then the title changes to say monthly results. And this is going to hopefully give people the ability to be, be a bit more expressive inside Power BI. So it's, it's very, very early days, uh, but I'm really excited about this. And I'm a very monotonous person, but trust me, I'm really excited. Um, I've also done an example of a density map, much like the violin plot with a gradient fill on it and a histogram, but also the um, annotation of a median line. So this is similar to the density plot. And this is really just to show that we can do some things with the visual, like we can do bidding and we can do aggregates. So we can do simple transforms inside the visual as well. So we think about supplying data to the visual as a table. Um, think your CSVs, your, your JSON raw data. So think of it like a Power BI table. And then you can do some things inside the visual to, to make the data bend to your will a little bit more. So here's a simple you know, dashboard where we've got the cities. I can click on this and the visual's pretty zippy. It's updating as we go. I can change my, my date range. I can see how things change. You can see that heat maps got a little less busy there. Um, but yeah, this is something that in terms of the, it's a cross between no code and low code. I'm hoping to bring this out soon. I think with that, I am going to relinquish my screen because I could talk about custom visuals all day and other people got to talk. 
Oh, that was awesome, Daniel. Daniel. That was awesome. That Thank was you. so good. That was um, a very quick fire um, introduction into all of the different options out there for creating um, uh, new visuals and using what's out of the box, but then um, also having a bit more uh, scope to go and develop more bespoke visuals. And we are we are sorry we kept you on a short time limit, mate. But I think uh, yeah, uh, that got they got much out of that. <laughs> yeah, there was heaps going on in the chat. Um, so we have. Um, Paran asked, is there a learning path or other sources to get started with custom visuals? Um, if we're talking about development, I have just published a course through Radicad, um, mm -hmm. and that teaches you how to use the TypeScript development kit, which is um, how Microsoft Visuals fully integrate with Power BI. So I will post the link for that in the chat because I have an affiliate code and I get more money if you use it. Oh, yes, um, we posted a link. So definitely everyone use Daniel's link. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm going to post that right now. Awesome. Yeah. Um, yes, dollars would be good because it took seven months to develop and it's about six and a half hours long. But hopefully it covers most of the stuff you need to know. It goes through a little bit about publishing to the marketplace and certification and a few of the other things that aren't covered elsewhere. And I'm hoping that it gives people what they need. And it would be really nice to have some company out in the community to talk about custom visuals. Awesome. Yeah, we can't wait to watch that. Um, also, um, Pranam asked another question, and feel free to go off mute if you want to ask this directly. Um, but Daniel, can you extrapolate the custom R and Python scripts to Power BI service when hosting on the cloud? You can within reason. So you typically need, and it depends how you source the, and I'm probably murdering this because they're not the, the ones I play around with so much, but it's pretty straightforward if you're using standard libraries. Um, with R, things like ggplot, plotly, et cetera, will work quite well. Uh, with Python, I think pandas and numpy and various other things are hosted in the service. If you're using custom ones, I'm pretty sure Seaborn's okay for Python. Um, it's often a case if you have to see, but Microsoft have, um, there's a page which I will dig out while another presentation's on. Ah, there you go. Andrew Exley's posted it. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Um, that, details the packages that are supported and there's the option on there to request others and Microsoft pretty much if you if you develop a custom visual rather than do it in in inside Power BI desktop um, if you use CRAN for your R packages um, it can install them which is quite cool, cool. yeah oh, fantastic and yeah thanks Andrew for posting those links and the last question was actually from Kerry she wants to know what Deneb stands for because it sounds very cool Okay, so Deneb is the brightest star in the constellation of Cygnus um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And along with Vega and Altair, it makes up the astronomical asterism called the Summer Triangle. Um, and I wanted to choose something that was closely related to Vega because they have their own ecosystem. Um, Altair was already taken, and that's already used for Python. And I dare you to look at Altair's logo and see if it looks familiar. Sorry, I should say icon. Look at oh. <laughs> You don't want to start that war again. <laughs> awesome. For those of you who aren't aware, Power BI got a new icon, and there's been a bit of a um, a bit of a joke running on Twitter lately, where everyone's calling it a logo. So it is an icon, not a logo. Yeah. Don't say it looks similar to Google Analytics. Yeah. Fantastic. That's no, that's awesome. great. Thanks a lot, Daniel. That was, I think a lot of people on the call got, got heaps out of that session, whether it's sort of beginner level for, um, you know, into custom visuals or a little bit more behind the scenes, what goes on. Um, are you happy to stay on the line for later on? Yeah, I'm, I'm hanging around. I'm really keen to see what, what everyone else is doing. I've seen what oh. Kerry's been doing previously, so I'm really excited to see where, where she is. Well, without further ado, mm -hmm. um, thanks again, mate. And <laughs> we'll share our screen and Alice will uh, take it away with the top five custom visuals for Enviros. Awesome. Cool. And if anyone does have any more questions for um, Daniel, just feel free to write them in the chat. If he's staying online, he can give you lots of detailed answers. So um, thanks again, Daniel. That was a really good introduction into uh, what options we have if we want to create some visuals which aren't out of the box in Power BI. Um, and today I want to do a really quick fly through um, what our top five custom visuals are for visualizing environmental data. Um, so top five is actually really hard to do. Uh, I did a top 10 in like one second and we usually we use custom visuals extensively. 
Um, but today we're focusing really on um, uh, the visual design component of um, the custom visuals. Um, because when we're working in the environmental industry, creating that connection between what the data um, what the data means and what that means physically in reality through the use of images, videos, maps, it's really important to create that connection. And um, especially because a lot of the environmental studies bring in data from a whole different range of data sources, um, it's really important that we can visually communicate that information. Cool, so here I've got a um, sample Power BI report which I've created um, for this demonstration. And uh, just a quick note, it is a synthetic Victorian water story. Uh, we've taken data from a whole range of different sources. Um, lots of them are legitimate sources, but the way we brought it together doesn't really make much sense. So let's just focus on the visuals today. Um, so you can see here on the screen, we've got um, a big map which shows um, different locations across Victoria. Uh, so you can see we've got a couple of um, forests here. We have lots of wetlands and different reservoirs. Uh, but this map, this map is a standard map. Um, so you can see over here in the visualizations pane, we're just bringing in a standard map and we're just visualizing our data using longitude and latitude. Um, but really what I wanna show on this map is I wanna show a number of different point locations but I also want to show a range of waterways. So we've got a couple of um, environmentally significant rivers here we want to display. And also we want to display different water corporations. So these are regions across Victoria. So really I want to have a map which allows me to display uh, points, uh, lines and polygons all at the same time. And um, as Daniel showed us, we can get a whole range of different custom visuals here from AppSource. And um, today I want to walk through uh, the icon map. So this is a custom visual which has been created by James Dale. And at the moment, this is my favorite mapping visual for Power BI. Uh, so why I love it is you can combine points, lines and polygons all in the same map, has heaps of data formatting options as well. So let's take a look. So I just selected that visual and I converted it into an icon map here. And now I'm just going to populate some of the fields. So let's bring down our latitude and longitude we've got here in these field wells. And let's bring out a little bit more um, information that we need to build this map. So we need a category. Here I've just got a basic index. And um, we've got a field here for icon URL, WKT and SVG. So what this allows us to do is it allows us um, to bring our data uh, into Power BI, store it as WKT. So this is well-known text. Um, I think it's a standard uh, spatial file format um, used in uh, kind of SQL. And you can convert it using programs like um, QGIS as well. So it allows us to store our data directly inside of Power BI, which is really good. So you can see I've just quickly brought that in. I've got some um, polygons here. Um, to display points, we actually need to use the size field. So I'm going to bring that in. For my map here, I don't want size. Um, size doesn't really matter. I'm going to have them all as the same size here. And then the last fields I'm going to bring in. So this, this map has heaps of different field options. Uh, we're actually going to do a deep dive into icon map at our next meetup where we've got our uh, mapping masterclass. So I'm going to whip through this really quickly. So we can format um, our fill color and our outline color as well. And you can see that we've got the beginnings of what looks like a really nice map. If we go behind the scenes here into the formatting options, um, we've got a whole range of different options that we're able to format. So I want to make these icons stand out a lot more. So I'm going to bring up their minimum size to 20. Oh, 30 is a bit big. <laughs> Let's do 20. Cool. So now we can see these icons really clearly. And icon map, it also allows you to bring in your own custom background layer as well. Uh, so you can see it has a whole lot of different um, default options here, like some from the map box libraries. But for us, I want to bring in a custom URI. So in Mapbox, I've created my own um, uh, background for this map. 
So if we bring this in here, um, you can see that you can make a really, uh, really rich, uh, nice map here, which combines um, here. We've just got polygons and points um, because I've got my rivers here as uh, polygons as well to make it a bit easier to select. But you can see just like any other visual, everything um, is able to be interactive and we can click around our map just like we can with any other visual. And lastly, another feature I love about this map is its ability to um, configure report page tooltips. So um, for those of you who, who also love Mapbox as a custom visual mapping option, uh, one of the big limitations with Mapbox is um, it doesn't support report page tooltips. So here you can see I've got a special report page tooltip, and when we hover over each of these items, we can get a lot more information about what it's displaying. So that was um, my first top custom visual. And um, the rest of the custom visuals that we love are all really focused around, um, around imagery as well. So let's take a look. So this is the um, report page tooltip, which I just showed you. I'm just going to make this page a little bit bigger so it's easier to play around with. Um, and when trying to communicate environmental data, it's always really nice if you can paint that picture by including an image um, to see what the waterway looks like or even an icon to display um, uh, what, like what a forest is and what a water corporation is. And there are a lot of different image custom visuals available in the marketplace. Um, our favorite go-to one is Image by CloudScope. So if I bring this one in, the reason why we like this is that it's really simple um, and it allows you to connect up um, image URLs, including hosting your image URLs um, in measures as well. So we usually just use it in the simplest format to bring in an image. So you can see you can resize it here. Uh, one thing you'll notice about using custom visuals is it's really clunky sometimes to like edit and move them. So you can see I'm trying to move this one. It's not really playing around with me. Um, we, when working with custom visuals, we always like to use um, some of the formatting options here. So let's put this into position. Yeah, we'll make it a little bit, bit smaller so it fits nicely. And then change the page size here back to what it was previously. I think it was like Cool, so now we can see when we hover over our icon map. Here you can see that that um, little icon changes based on what it is that we're hovering over. So in this instance, we're just using an icon, but um, we've used this technique with showing site photos. So what does this site look like? Um, or providing um, an image of something like an animal or flora or fauna as well. So that's the second custom visual. Keeping on a very similar theme here, um, we've got a couple more image visuals to share with you. Um, so here what we've got is some information about a water balance. Um, you can see here we've got an image of um, an integrated water management water cycle. And on the right hand side, we've got information about different elements um, of our integrated water management cycle. So a custom visual which we go to a lot uh, for displaying um, really kind of text heavy information in a nice readable format is the card browser. So I'm going to convert this table into a card browser here. So again it's got quite a few different fields here that we can populate. I'm just going to shuffle some of these around here. Um, so it needs a document ID. We'll bring our index in. Got our subcategory. Let's put our description down into the content. Awesome. And we'll fix up some of the formatting so we can see a couple more of these cards on the screen. So you can see it is really nice. We can scroll through the information and see it a little bit more clearly than if it was in a table. Uh, but one of my favorite aspects of this custom visual is the ability to combine text with images. So I'm just going to bring in our title image URL. 
So here you can see an image for each of these different categories. We can also bring in different badge icons up here as well. And include different top bar colors just to further categorize these cards. So we can see when we click on one of these um, cards, we can expand it to get a little bit more information if we had more data here. So we've used this a lot, um, really is like a really nice kind of flip card gallery. Um, you can use it for environmental values and um, different elements of the water cycle. It's really nice in projects which are aimed at um, community consultation or stakeholder engagement as well just to create that user friendly experience and really, um, really paint the picture. So over here on the left hand side, we've got um, we're using our image custom visual again. Uh, we've just got an image of the integrated water cycle. Um, but wouldn't it be really nice if we could actually zoom in on this image to get a little bit more detail and interact with this image as well so that we can um, kind of click on the data in a way that we understand it. Um, so one of our favorite custom visuals for creating interactive infographics is called the synoptic panel. So this is a custom visual by the OK Viz team. I'm just going to convert this in here. So um, what you need as an input into this um, into this custom visual is you need an SVG um, uh, SVG image, uh, which is bound to your data. Um, so if you go online, you can go to let's bring this up. Go into Synoptic Designer. Uh, this is a tool that the custom visual team have created to help us create um, our uh, SVG image. So all we need to do is drag in. I don't think I have it in this folder, um, but all we have to do is drag in our um, PNG and a PNG image and draw areas around each element and we bind it to the data as well. So once we've got that, um, then what we do is we can just import uh, the image that we've uh, made interactive. So you can see this image is exactly the same as previously, but I've got a couple of areas here which I have used uh, Synoptic Designer to make interactive. So these have some, these are able to be bound to my data. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna bring in my subcategories here. So I'm binding this in the most simplest format. You can do really cool things with this. Um, is it not coming in? Oh yeah. You can do really cool things with this custom visual, um, like binding it to different measures and having different um, colors meaning different values. So if you have really high flow in one area versus low flow in another area, um, and you can do dynamic changing of your base map as well. Um, so it is a really cool visual. I'm just gonna make some of these default colors stand out. And now we can see when we hover over um, this visual, we can see um, the different categories. And when we click on it, our card browser updates. So we've used this um, in a couple of reports. Um, our most recent report was um, a study we're working on with DELP. We're helping them create their online biennial statement. And they've got a really um, nice infographic of the Victorian water grid. Uh, so we've put that into Synoptic Panel and made all of the different elements interactive. So we can click on different pipes and reservoirs and um, learn more about that data as well. So it's a really good application. Oh, so that was uh, my fourth favorite custom visual. Uh, lucky last is, of course, we can't do a presentation on custom visuals without mentioning any of Daniel's custom visuals. Um, so this uh, last visual is the HTML content visual. Um, so in Power BI, uh, one, one application of it that we've used really recently actually is um, to allow us to do rich text formatting. Uh, so the HTML content, you can um, put a little bit of HTML code in your data and you can um, format your text with bullet points and things like that, which is just really nice. Um, but our application we want to show today is again about bringing your data to life and creating that emotional connection 
between um, the data and what it actually means in reality. So here you can see I've selected on Merrimi Reservoir. And let's say we want to learn more about Merrimi. Uh, here we've got our image by CloudScope Visual again. Um, noting that this isn't what Merrimi looks like. This is just a synthetic image. Um, but wouldn't it be really nice if instead of seeing an image of the reservoir, we could see a video of the aerial drone footage of what this reservoir looks like in reality. So we can see the size, um, have a look at the capacity, and really feel like we know the data a bit better. So using Daniel's amazing HTML content custom visual, I'll convert this over. And um, it's a very simple visual, but it can do some really complex things. Um, for us, all we really want to put in is HTML code of a video. So at the moment, this looks like it's not working. So one thing to note about the HTML content when using it to display videos is it doesn't work in the Power BI desktop. We actually have to publish it up online to the Power BI service um, so we can see it in action. So just while this is publishing, um, another recent use case of HTML content for us, again, focusing on vis uh, videos, is the ability to have live stream video coming in and um, we can play that in our Power BI reports. So imagine if you had live stream video of your different catchments, um, in our case, it's of uh, the ocean ports, um, and you can have that coming in and having a look at, um, at what, what each of uh, those areas look like in real time. So let's have a look at this reservoir. So here we've got Merrimi Reservoir, and you can see it just really helps to create that connection, and we can actually physically see what our environments look like in, um, in real life, essentially. So that was a really quick top five uh, custom visuals that we use in the environmental industry. The list is um, endless. A couple of other top contenders are the Play Axis, of course, Mapbox, Chiclet Slicer, um what else do we like box and whisker plot mm, violin plot oh violin small multiples <laughs> um but yeah that was that was it from me were there any um were there any uh questions that anyone had in um in the group or um feel free to go off mute and ask stop sharing thanks daniel for answering a few as you went it's good yeah Okay, I, awesome. think, I think it's yeah probably uh, on to you, Kerry. Now, if you want to start sharing, and we can um, oh, hang on. Yeah. Should... Yeah. Cool. Just while you're sharing, um, we might just quickly answer Manny's question. Um, so how easy was setting up Synoptic panel? Um, so it can be it can be really easy if your infographic is easy. Uh, then we can just use the Synoptic designer, and you can um. Uh, delineate different areas of your visual either manually or using the discoverable uh, the wizard tool. Yeah, Synoptic Designer does allow you to sort of draw your own polygons around areas. So a common use case for it is in like um, warehouses, so supply chain and understanding what your stock levels are. So that's quite easy because you have sort of squares and rectangles, yeah. but you can be a little bit it can be a bit clunky if your image isn't sort of designed correctly. Um, yeah, you can use other tools. So for the Vic Water Grid one, we used um, Adobe Illustrator and just did it all in a, in Illustrator. So you can use other design tools if you're more used to using it. Cool. Cool. Um, but with that, I think um, we're map office layout. Yeah, awesome. Cool. Um, but with this, we are on to our final presentation for today, and we're very privileged to have Kerry here to chat to us about Beyond Click and Viz. So we um, uh, kind of virtually met Kerry. Um, she was posting heaps of awesome things on LinkedIn, uh, really cool visuals. Um, so very excited to welcome you to our group today and can't wait for this presentation. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Uh, it's a um, different uh, speed and pace this one. Um, I'm going to be telling a story rather than a show and tell. Um, and unfortunately, it is going to be to just to slides, um, which is 
quite droll, I know, and boring, but um, I'm having quite a lot of difficulties with my internet connection at the moment. So um, I did, however, publish um, some of the content. Um, so I can drop some links in the chat if anybody wants to uh, play with the visuals and, and in their own time. And uh, off we go. So um, I'm going to talk today about my Power BI journey over the years um, with a particular emphasis on data viz and design. Um, I love all aspects of BI, collecting, gathering, transforming data, you know, analyzing, interrogating and synthesizing, uh, you know, all the information that I've gathered. Um, but the hardest part of the whole process um, for me is uh, visual communication and design, not for myself, but for other users. Um, it seems an entirely different skill set, and it's certainly one that I have yet to master. Oh, I've already gone to the next slide. I didn't realize I did that. Um, so my journey began in 2017 when I began in a new role. Um, prior to that, I had quite a diverse background in a number of industries, um, you know, from insurance, education, government, defense, engineering, uh, floristry even. Uh, not for long because I developed hay fever, so I was a pretty useless employee. Uh, my studies were equally varied too, so um, social sciences with a side major um, business, and that's kind of influenced um, some of my design practices as well. Uh, coming into the new role, one of my tasks was um, weekly sprint reporting, um, the existing process being very mandrolic and a lot of manual data entry, and um, if you know me, I don't like manual data entry and immediately set about um, Googling to find a way out of it, uh, coming across Power Query and a couple of weeks later, Power BI. So, since then, I've spent a number of years utilizing Power BI to make reporting more efficient and effective and with fairly good success. And throughout that time, I've built uh, reports for a variety of audiences, analysts, operational managers, executives, each having you know, their own informational needs. Um, not new to people that are in BI, but it was certainly something that I um, learned quite quickly. Analysts and operational managers are hungry for data. They love their drill throughs and drill downs, you know, buttons and choices to slice and dice their data. And executives on the other hand are entirely different um, and will not drill, th sorry, will not drill through. Um, so analysts and operational managers know their domain and their data very well, and executives see reports from all across the business, day in, day out, always in the same corporate template, always in the same corporate colours, and they need to be reminded what they're looking at. Um, they won't be investigating what a blip or anomaly in a report is, that you know, they'd rather be told, uh, which presented a number of design challenges for me when building these Power BI reports. How could I simply provide this information on a page without providing, you know, with providing context to what they were looking at? How could I reduce the time taken to consume information, um, highlight key information from the noise, and you know, all the while reducing the time taken for myself and my team members to build these reports and generate these reports? And so having been a student of psychology, um, I was definitely reminded of some of my studies um, in my foundational one-on-one -on -one courses and had a particular uh, interest in emerging studies as well. Uh, some of these principles uh, influenced my designs, but a lot of it came down to intuition, you know, practice and experimentation. I'm not going to describe them in great detail. And so here we go. So this is what a dashboard looked like in 2017 for my um, domain of portfolio management. And um, a lot of people liked it, you know, very excited by it. But um, for me, I, I didn't enjoy um, using the, this template at all uh, in the respect that it was quite busy. Um, it was too much to look at. Everything was competing for my information, for my attention, and um, I didn't really know where to go to derive the insights that I needed. Um, so, you know, coming here, for example, projects by type, very interesting information, but something I'd only look at once or twice a year. Coming down the side, um, project count, project cost, um, you know, what's that over uh, budgetary years? Cost variance, for example, is that over and under? Is it within tolerance? Project work and work variance, you know, when and where is that work variance occurring? Is it in the mid three months or is it in, you know, the next three years? 
and um, active risks and issues. That's you know far too many to to, to deal with. But the um, the visual here, project governance by phase, is one that I was focused on um, in making it difficult to read, being a big blank here. Um, the number of projects and proposal, for example, being about 10 potentially, maybe one in selection, eight in planning, maybe 21 in execution. And this one was um, definitely an improvement. So, um, in, you know, much more engaged and drawn into this one. It's, you know, nicer to look at. And, um, you know, per the aesthetic, user, you know, usability effects, for example, um, it, you know, it feels easier to use. So people perceive designs with great aesthetic um, as easier to use. However, it's not really the case. Um, so when looking at how to, the time taken to its, uh, consume this information and the scanning patterns that people use, for example, drawing my eyes over here is where I start, which is a great little visual so I can slice and dice the information down here. Um, and then I'm drawn over here. And my eyes are sort of following this pattern come to overdue risks, for example, and then I'm wanting to um, select and slice and dice the below table uh, by this card and find that I can't. Um, scanning down, coming down to improvements and enhancements, um, I can see it's in progress with a due date of 2017. Um, overall status being green, schedule status amber, work status, resource status, you know, kind of lost where, where I am now, I have to scan back over. Cost status, doing the same thing, making sure I'm in line, issue status, and then coming over to, to complete. Um, I get a number here, 21. Um, I see that's percent complete. And then in my head, I'm trying to um, picture that as a percentage of a whole. So, first steps. Um, so, one of the first things I did was uh, change this graphic. Um, into a graphic that was more familiar to um, myself and end users. This is using the synoptic panel, um, utilizing SVG. And um, it's a visual representation of the gov uh, portfolio governance processes that we have. And uh, the chevrons show movement through phases, color saturation, um, as opposed to size to indicate uh, quantity. And I used iconography here to further um, embed um, and make recollection, uh, recollection easier um, for those going forward. And then this is what it looks like. Um, being a more modern visual, I did try to find earlier, um, earlier visuals of this, but things have moved on since then. Um, and what you can see here is it's quite a simple. I've taken a lot of the information and the noise out of it. Um, coming over here, you can see clearly that it's organized by objective rather than um, project type. And that coming down here, you can see we've got a nice, healthy backlog of information. And Alice and Christian got a lot of work to do. Um, and you see, yeah, scrolling down, you'll find that it's you know got confidence that it's everything's on track, everything's um, tracking on progress, and that it's you know evenly spaced out all on time. Again, similar thing, um, get confidence that you've got a nice healthy backlog here. You know, you've got to click on each of the chevrons and um, slice through the, the list. And coming on to the next, you'll find that um, there's something, you know, that's dragging for your attention. Um, as you can see, there's only one project. Um, it's off track, perhaps it's, um need some more in the backlog or we need to take some action and get the project back on track. So the next thing um, I looked at doing as well was trying to improve the iconography here. And try to avoid the rag colours initially. Um, however, people's mental models of what RAC indicators and KPIs were, were very deeply ingrained. So um, the green stayed. Um, and the, the iconography was used to sort of help assist in recollection and make the reading of the um, chart easier. And I um, utilised SVGs here with colour fill. So 
So um, my go-to visuals, Synoptic Panel and Visio, visually remind and embed corporate processes. Um, and some other things since then, and I was naturally chomping at the bit to extend this further, in which case HTML came in, which was uh, very awesome. Um, gave me some freedom, bank canvas, uh, HTML being quite simple to learn, and um, played around with doing a number of things, embedding videos, presentations. Don't know why, but I decided to try and um, embed Google Slides work quite nicely. No need to do it, though. And um, other charts such as raw graph, data wrapper, Google charts um, worked really well, which I thought was fun. So one of the first things I decided to do was extend um, what I was doing with SVGs. So not just color fill, but manipulate the width of an object. And one of the first things I thought to do was um, do a Pinocchio's news. So I Googled um, for a data set on lies and came back with a quite a rich one. Um, I've changed the subject's um, likeness for this demonstration. I feel like because I don't want to make any political statements. Um, and what I've done here is uh, used Adobe Illustrator um, to trace an image of a um, side profile and then placed an SVG over the top an SVG rectangle, and then when you hit play here, sorry, it's slides, not a demonstration, um, we'll go through the days and look something like that. So um, one of the things I, I drew from this that it was quite interesting um, was it was quite impactful to watch this and um, you know, taking a neutral set of stats and numbers and quotes made it quite emotive and found it really quite interesting to see how the design um, can lead people's interpretation of data and um, potentially influence their emotions and potentially their next thoughts and actions. And so whilst not done deliberately, um, by not showing a comparison point on this, I thought it was, um, and taking away information could lead to people making assumptions on their data and filling in gaps and cells. And the look at the code is quite simple here. So the original nose size and the um, coordinates for each of the lies, and then the silhouette of the image and the width adjustment going forward. So the next thing I decided to do um, was take that and manipulate the direction of an object. And that being the clock here. And this being a matrix visual using custom conditional icons. So it's simply the degrees of each hour divided by 12 multiplied by the, the hour. We've got the minute hand here, oh, and the um, hour hand here rotated each of the corresponding degrees. And then the next thing I um, decided to try and experiment with was manipulate the width and the direction of an object. Kerry, this is really awesome. I was just wondering, you've got some links in the slides. Are they links to your um, your example reports on Data Stories Gallery? Or? Yeah, they are. Um, so drop them in? To, yeah, maybe if you drop them in the in the um, in the chat, then everyone can kind of play along at the same time. I really want to play with that um, fact checking one. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. There we go. That's the first one. Cool. Awesome. Keep going. This is amazing. I love all the use of SVG. <laughs> yeah. And that's the wee second one there.
kind of lost where I am now. Sorry, guys. Um, yep, so this is a peek at the code, um, the pie chart being the hardest one. Um, and the turbine as well. I've completely lost my train of thought now, but it's all right. Sorry, Kerry, that was my fault. <laughs> I know you were right. Yeah, you were just going through um, where you were up to with the talking about, um, I think, combining all of the elements together with HTML on this one. Yeah, um, I think I might just leave it there, actually, if that's all right. If anybody has any questions, I was going to summarize that up um, basically with some of my learnings. Um, but I'm all good to ask them some questions. Have you got any? Yeah, was there any um, questions in the meantime um, for Kerry? Otherwise, I'd love to hear it all um, summed up as well. Um, I'd just be interested to see the key learning slide. It looked interesting. Uh, um, you know, just if we can have that in the background while you're answering stuff. Sorry, Kerry, did you did you get that? Mate, Richard, do you want to just repeat that again, please? Just Yeah, it'd be good. I, I always interested in key learnings. If you could just um, pop that up for a bit while you're answering uh, questions, Kerry. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, if you don't mind sharing again. Should have warned you guys, I'm a very nervous speaker. <laughs> no, that was excellent. Really well. um, yeah, I <laughs> love the progression of the story and just um, it's so interesting to hear people's different journeys. Um, yeah. I did have a question for you. Um, sorry to butt in if there was other questions. Uh, it was yeah. just in your um, your scorecard you had uh, where you were talking about the iconography. Um, you had a really interesting representation of um, the uh, kind of progression. It was all those little blocks. As oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was wondering um, uh, how we would go about creating that and if you had any sample code for um for that one i think that could be really interesting for an environmental scorecard yep so uh, that's mostly uh, unicode um, cool. which oh, i leveraged nice. from the quick measures gallery way back when oh awesome so that's really simple then yeah yeah and i thought that was a better way of representation uh, representing the uh, percentage complete yeah awesome yeah. can you change the color of unicode no, not really. Oh, no, you can, but not in DAX. Because yeah, it might just text. be formatting the element, the value of the matrix. You might have to change everything. Yeah. Yeah. I um I had more of a design question, Kerry. So obviously, you know, you got great attention to detail with sort of like the psychology and colors and icons and bringing it all together. What's some of your go-to resources um, that you use for sort of capturing capturing the essence of that and bringing it into your reports? Because they look really cool. Um, go-to resources. Well, I don't know that I they actually do have any, and that was part of the story that I was trying to tell, and the fact that it's very difficult. So, um, to thing to master because it comes down to a lot of um, practice and trial and error and sort of trying to understand your audience. Um, it's, yeah. True, and Certainly, it subjective. Yeah. <laughs> it's very subjective, yeah. Yeah, but I, I have utilized um, David Eldersveld yeah. as a, a good resource for um, SVGs and design in that respect. Yeah, he does some awesome stuff. Yeah, um, so he is a blog. I think it's Dataveld. Um, we can include a connection to that in the um, in the blog write up as well. He has some really good things. Also, in accessibility, I've read one of his ones about um, uh, best font types for people that might have a bit of dyslexia as well, and just things that you need to consider when you're, you know, especially when you're building out public facing reports. But um, yeah, it's really good. Yeah. Do we have any any questions from anyone else on the call? About not just for Kerry, maybe for Daniel or for Alice as well. Or if anyone wants to share what their favourite custom visuals are, if anyone's discovered a, a cool one recently for environmental data. Thanks, Daniel. 
Douglas as a former presenter um, last time. Do you have any of your favourite custom visuals that you like? You had some fantastic tips last time. Mm. Thanks for sharing, Andrew. So good colour resource. Is that just for choosing good colour palettes? I'll have a look at it now. Oh, it looks cool. Looks very cool. Really powerful. Yeah. Great, um, thanks. We've got a question from uh, Stefanos. Uh, have any of ha so have any of us had any experience with Power BI and the ArcGIS extension? Um, have you used it, Kerry? ArcGIS? Yeah, the visual in Power BI. No, very lightly. Yeah, I'm the same. I've only used it very lightly. So um, you can do um, uh, standard kind of bubble maps. Uh, you can put uh, a time component into it, which is a really nice feature. Um, but to get lots of the capabilities out of it, you really need an ArcGIS Esri Online license with the Power BI add-in. That allows you to bring in um, custom base maps into it. Um, I find that a lot of the features you can get in other mapping visuals like Mapbox or Icon Map. Um, Daniel, have you had experience playing around with the ArcGIS map? Why would you ask me about mapping in a public <laughs> setting, Alice? I know, uh, yeah, I know you're not um, you like shy away from um, that. <laughs> I, I have only used it in a cursory way. I, yeah. I, don't, I don't like mapping in Power BI very much. No, uh, hope that changes. it's a struggle. I do understand Esri are putting a lot of um, time behind the scenes into sort of updating their, their Power BI visual or their specific visual. So um, maybe there'll be some cool updates in the, uh, in the, in the not too distant future. It'd be really yeah. good. So Douglas um, uses the native mapping option. So he really likes he really likes icon map to expand map use features as well. But yeah, it is good to stick with the native visuals um, because sometimes you can run into a few challenges using custom visuals if your organization doesn't support the use um, or the uncertified custom visuals, you can't export to PDF or PowerPoint from the service, things like that. Um, we've got another question um, uh, from someone who would like to have us talk a little bit about live data and how to build reports on that and what visuals would be good. So um, have you used worked with uh, live data before Kerry. So I think um, this could either be direct query, which is where you um, uh, query the database so all of your data is live, or it could be like a live streaming data set in Power BI service um, or reading in data from APIs. Daniel, what about your sort of experiences dealing with live data or near near yeah, real time data? Yeah, I know data? you've been helping us with a cool example recently. I was going to say, how much can I talk about? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, or maybe five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I guess I guess summing it up, there's a couple of ways you can do it. Um, you've got streaming data sets which are not particularly extensible, um, so they tend to work within dashboards, and you can maybe expose them to a report, but not really share them with other data sets. So you start to um, have to think about how to plan them. They're generally quite useful for simple stuff. I, I built some stock ticker stuff a while back, which was quite simple. Um, but beyond that, I, I didn't really get a lot out of it, and I don't do a lot of device uh, monitoring and things like that, where you want to stream it in and just see it in real time. Um, What's been quite fun is what we've been recently working on at Discovery AI, which is um, building a near real-time solution using Direct Query and Azure SQL, and very simply um, building a really simple API scraping function with Azure Functions. So Azure Functions are code that you can host inside Azure that really don't cost very much to run at all, and put them on a timer, and every couple of minutes and it pushes the data into the database and we can set Power BI up to requery it and we've got some pretty good tracking of some things going on, which is quite good. Um, we're really just fresh off off the boat with that one. So it, we'd probably want a little bit of time to, wrap, uh, to write it up if we wanted to do a bit more detail on it. Um, but generally you need to augment Power BI with something external in terms of a data source. So a good SQL database with a decent direct query connection is quite good. Um, APIs are tricky. 
to do near real time mm. without getting into custom connectors and things like that. And I th that ain't my bag, I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah, but there's a couple of options out there. Um, so yeah, it's either a direct query or if you just want to have a dashboard tile, then a streaming data set's pretty good. Um, we're also getting a few questions coming in. Um, one from Manny. So maybe this is a good one for you, Kerry. From a design point of view, how do you select what's the right page size? So specifically um, when you want a number of visuals, when it varies from page to page, um, do you have any strategies on how to select the right page size? Um, I guess uh, it depends the the purpose of the report that you're building predominantly. Yeah. So um, it's if you're presenting to a, a business audience, it's always good to keep to sort of the PowerPoint slide format. But if it's presenting externally, um, for example, the scrolling format is always pretty good as well. Yeah, definitely. So, uh, some, yeah, the content. Yeah, and I know that um, I think by default it's the, what is it, 16 by 9? Yeah. Um, and that's, that covers a lot of um, use cases because it can go for the widescreen, the desktop monitors. Um, but one thing I've seen people do is to increase that page size resolution. Um, uh, just keep the ratio the same, but just increase it because then that means you can fit um, more visuals on the canvas and you can have more control over things like your font size. So you, everyone's I was just going to mention the font size one. Yeah, because it's kind of an, it's annoying sometimes if you want to squish so many visuals onto one page, but Power BI only goes down to font size eight and it automatically reduces your access interval, things like that. So I've gotten around it on one report I had to work on. I hated changing the page size, but the client really wanted a lot of detail on their chart. So I don't know. What are your thoughts, Daniel? I generally find stuff works better at default, to be honest. Um, I think you generally want to try. It's the thing with reports and dashboards is you don't want to overwhelm people. And Kerry probably can speak to this a little better than I can on a psychological um, and cognitive basis. But it's tempting to just cram as many visuals as you can into a page. And there's a lot of reasons, not just for performance, why you'd want to do that. Um, it's really about focusing on what's telling the story and supporting what you're trying to say and making it logically, you know, easy to read. You know, uh, Kerry talked a little bit about the natural reading order. That stuff's really important. Um, it's not just about shoving stuff on a page and calling it a day. And that's what that mm -hmm. approach is about. It's really important to see what works, tweak it, change it up, find better ways. Data adapts and evolves over time as well. Particularly when people get used to what they're seeing or they have new questions, um, things get less prevalent. You know, there's, there's it's it's an evolutionary process. But yeah, I didn't really answer your question apart from wander off a bit. But uh, no, I like the I like the standard sizes. <laughs> nah, it's it's, it's all a valuable. challenge for me to keep everything um, from blowing up too much. Yeah, and you can always use the bookmarks to show and hide if you want to squeeze in any more visuals. Um, uh, I think there's one more question. Um, any suggestions for 3D terrain visualizations for GIS data? So that's that's an interesting one. 3D terrain is tricky because usually you get it as um, uh, like raster based um, images. And I I don't know. So Mapbox you can do 3D extrusions, but it's not nice because you wouldn't want to have every single uh, uh, element of your uh, spatial terrain grid to be um, 3D. It wouldn't work nicely. You can't have that many elements on a map anyway. I think I think when you're getting into 3D terrain visualization, I think there's you been a lot of up, well, there's been a lot of conversation about how BI is continuing to evolve in the mapping space. But there's probably a few solutions where it might not necessarily be there just yet. Um, so we've had to put in for a few different proposals and opportunities out there where you recognize that Power BI might be limited based on if they want a really, you know, map map rich functionality solution. And I think um, Kimberly made a good comment there about Esri, who developed ArcGIS, are um, putting in their own efforts into their own dashboarding solutions. Um, 
So thanks for sharing that. So I guess, yeah, you really need to consider it. We haven't had a lot of luck with 3D terrain sort of visualizations yet, but there are possibly visuals out there. Yeah. Have you come across any, Daniel, for 3D mapping? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've seen a couple of 3D uh, planning type ones, which are showing a lot of promise and really clever. Um, but it's, yeah, it's not something I've really delved into in big detail. Oh, yeah. How about you, Sounds Kerry? Sounds like a good you challenge, do? though. No. Oh, you do? You like that one? <laughs> awesome. Maybe. Oh, we'll chat about it. 3D maps would be awesome for uh, visualizing like uh, geological models or um, even flood mapping. Well, maybe I know Azure Map is relatively recent, but maybe they're looking at you know expediting a lot of what Azure Map can really bring bring to the table as a mapping solution. Sorry, Kerry, any sort of comments with mapping? No. There's a lot of um, comments. Not really much. Chat. Oh. Yeah, awesome. I think everyone's getting excited for maps, which is amazing because I'll just share our screen again. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Everyone go check out um, Kerry's awesome report on the data stories gallery. Just quickly. This is so cool. So this is using the HTML content and it just automatically um, updates the SVG elements. Very, yeah. very cool. Actually, this is the coolest thing. <laughs> yeah, that's what we saw on um on LinkedIn. It was very cool. Yeah. So share that. So just to guess in wrapping up, um, thanks again to our presenters. So Kerry, Daniel, and Alice. That was a really good session. And hopefully everyone that, that dialed in got a lot out of it. Um, if you do want to revisit it, we're recording this and we'll have it up on our YouTube and as a blog, just with some of the key key summary points from each of the presenters. Um if you, we're always looking for people um, for future sessions. So as we'll touch on in the next one, we've got our January session, likely got our February locked in as well. But um, please, even if you just want to present, you know, 10, 15 minutes, um, just share a little bit of your story and what you're sort of working in with Power BI. Um, we'd love to hear from you as well. And uh, lock this one in your diaries, especially if you are big on mapping, which was a lot of questions coming out today. But um, we've got three presenters. So Alice will expand on what she touched on with Icon Map um, in January. We've got Idris from the City of Melbourne, who's going to be unpacking the Mapbox API and um, sharing a little bit of the work there at City of Melbourne. And we've also got Chani, um, works for Mosaic Insights, and she's going to be talking about the Carto uh, mapping platform as well. So outside of Power BI, but still a mapping focus and how you can use it for your spatial analysis and visualization. And yeah, just to close out, we've this is our third meetup session and we've really appreciated the support and hopefully everyone that's been dialing in has gotten a lot out of it. We enjoy presenting it and connecting with the community and sort of learning all the time. Um, we hope you do too, but hope everyone has a really safe, fantastic Christmas and New Year's break. And Thanks for everyone for uh, coming along and especially to our presenters again for wearing their hats. Yeah, <laughs> thanks, Kerry. Thanks, Daniel. That was amazing. <laughs> and thank you, everyone, for all your lovely comments. We're getting a lot of love in the chat. So feel free just to go off mute. We might hang around for another minute or two. Um, if anyone wants to say hi or has any ideas for future sessions or anything like that. But, uh, thank you, everyone, again. Thank you. So yeah, stop the recording. thank you. We might just stop the recording. Yeah. Do, yep. do, do. Sweet.